So welcome uh, to our WAPA program for April. And um, we are, um, I am Martha Hare. I am the program uh, chair for WAPA. <clears throat> and um, we are really excited to have uh, Professor Ted Downing here tonight. Um, we will be, um, he will be introduced by Dr. Jerry Moles. And then uh, what uh, Ted has a really exciting slideshow. It has some film in it. So it's best for us to hold Q&A to the end of the meeting. And there are a few ways that we can take care of Q&A, and I'll go over that afterwards um, when we're ready to switch over. So without um, uh, further ado, I'm going to first introduce Dr. Moles, who was a speaker about a year ago at this time. Jerry is, uh, he's working in Central Appalachia. Appalachia. He is, he continues to be involved with Sri Lanka, where he has worked for many years. And he's affiliated with the Global Evergreening Alliance. Or are you the, the principal on that? No, there are about 70 fellows now, all scientists from around the world. Yeah. And if you want to know more about that, you're going to have to look in the archive for his talk last year. Uh, of course, maybe at the end, you could also ask him a question or two about that as well. And um, they are uh, Dr. Malls and Dr. Downing are longtime friends and colleagues. They are, have, were classmates at Stanford. So, Jerry, why don't you introduce our speaker? Okay, I'm delighted to do so. This is quite a pleasure. We've known each other almost forever. Um, and as I think back, just the multiple sides of Ted's life, um, University of Arizona Faculty Senate, um, an international NGO protecting the lives and well-being of the displaced. Um, he's an entrepreneur in real estate and botanical medicine. Um, and we think back sometimes talking about Frank Hansian seminar at Stanford, which was sort of the gateway to become a responsible anthropologist to be able to say things that people can trust. So all of this is our background. And this is based on years of corresponding, arguing, visiting, all sorts of things from multiple perspectives. The thing that impresses me most about Ted is he has lived his life with an open mind, open to opportunities where he could provide good services on behalf of those living impoverished lives we think of impoverished in the broader sense um, whether being poverty displaced climate change violence or loss of ethnic identity all of this is part of ted's interest most of our discussions are about making sense of things how can we better understand the present circumstances in ways that we can solve problems facing homo sapiens with ted Things are never hypothetical. The focus is on what he's capable of doing that will make a difference. If it's a statement on the floor of the House of Representatives in the Arizona legislature or at a AAA meeting pointing out the actual on the ground consequences of what has happened to the Puenche. This wasn't an accident that this was an AA, AA meeting with the help of Barbara Johnson and other anthropologists, Ted needed a platform where he could explain the consequences for the Poenchi. Of course, the AAA meeting is right before Christmas and Ted described this poor Poenchi family, lost their home, had no place to go. And so they ended up in a stable and you know where they put the baby, in a manger. This forced the vice president of the World Bank to come unglued and demanded that Ted stop his presentations. But the point is that you take advantage, life is a process, and Ted goes through the process. He knows the game, he defines the game in ways that empowers him to make a difference. It's there for all to see. 
the SFAA officer now in Oklahoma, saved from going broke if it had stayed in West in Washington. Laws governing the operation of the University of Arizona to include the faculty through the state legislature. Released from jail in Mexico when his informants from Diaz Ordaz came to rescue him. There's always more to tell about Ted's life. So bottom line, and this is why the presentation is so important to the future of our discipline. Anthropology to survive in the modern world has to become a practice and I'm sure many of the people in WAPA understand what I'm saying. Ted practices his anthropology. It's an interpretive frame of reference, choosing from among all of those frames of reference where he can step in and make a difference, finding a clear path and following. So you're get, about to get a dose of this practicing anthropology. So go, Ted, it's all yours. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. And uh, yeah, practicing anthropology, I hope to get in trouble for malpractice here. I uh, just uh, uh, I am just so pleased to see uh, uh, people that are here, people that have participated, some of them in the story I'm going to tell tonight. And I think I've got to coin a term. This is an this is a storyography like an ethnography where I'm going to talk about not so much our, myself and Carmen, and by the way, Carmen's sitting right here, say hello, there's mm -hmm. Carmen, okay, hello. yeah, and uh, not so much about what we did, but about what a group did, and how this, and if I can move to the share screen, can I do that? Yeah, and there we go, let's see if this works, uh, and I hope I don't have that chat thing up here do I at the same time is it okay now yes it is yes it is good what i'm going to tell you is change the title slightly because as i went through it and thought about it uh i think this more matches uh uh what i what i'm talking about the pewenchi is balancing the cosmic order if that sounds kind of global you'll understand that it maybe is true that the pewenchi indians contribution to sector investment and let me see if I can make this thing move forward. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay, so let, let me begin with a little bit of a, some video in here. And the video uh, has never been seen before. I, we found it in some of our archives as we went through. And the story begins in 1995, and I think Juan Pablo was here with us. Uh, and uh, in 1995, Carmen and I were bouncing along a newly opened road in the highlands of Chile that was going into a new dam. The class five rapids of the BOBO were so loud that I could barely hear my Pewenchi passenger, and we were almost shouting. He was taking responsibility for a Middle Eastern conflict on the other side of the world. My reaction was mental or something that, uh, you know, what what's going on here? And uh, let's see if I can make this thing move. And, uh, but I was wrong. I used to learn that these remarkable people, uh, which are an offshoot of Mapuches, periodically offer animal sacrifices and prayers in a collective ceremony called a guillatun, rituals in order to maintain the balance among the different cosmic forces and avoid catastrophe. By the end of my story tonight, you may begin to believe that the Pewinchi were right. Uh, between 1992 and 2003, the risk for social disorder from private international capital investment was substantially reduced by the crystallization of global social standards. Some of these, there are some extraordinary people who were engaged in helping crystallize what became an international set of social, economic, uh, environmental standards. Uh, on the screen, you'll see right there, first the Pewinchi team that we had in, in Alto Bio Bio. They've aged a little bit from this point, as have I and Carmen. Uh, Michael Chernia uh, holding up his hand and a glass of water. Uh, Barbara Rose Johnson, who's with us tonight. Uh, Bill Partridge. Uh, uh, Scott Guggenheim on the lower left. Uh, and uh, and this is Dan Aronson, who's unfortunately passed away in 2010, but very active, if I remember right, in WAPA. And then finally, Claudio and 
Claudio Gonzalez and Jeannie Simpson, husband and wife team. Uh, he's Mapuche from uh, the Universidad de Concepcion. And, uh, and then we have, of course, the most important participants in this story, which are the Mapuches and uh, the Pewinches themselves. And uh, you may find you may find it disturbing to see that they don't dress like Native Americans. Uh, I'll explain that later uh, why that's so. And that's our, our team working. Now let me go back for those of you that are not engaged in international finance. So I think about half looking at the participants, about half of you. Uh, early in the 80s, the 70s and 80s, and into the right the beginning of the 90s. A group of anthropologists, sociologists, and non-governmental groups discovered that infrastructure development creates localized poverty and environmental risk. We need the infrastructure. You need the power. You need the roads. But there was associated with it the risk of creating poverty at the same time. As a group, working a lot of them, this actually is Washington-based, they began to develop within the World Bank as the headquarters, it went to other banks. They begin to develop a set of safeguard policies. And what the idea was to mitigate the impact and to avoid it, they would have a set of procedures that operated in the lending. So the, 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 the activities happened in the financial sector. And these social scientists, these policies, we're well into their first generation when this story is going to take place, which is about 1990. And uh, what happened at this point is the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, which was a very, it started in 1956, but within the World Bank, it was kind of a small corner. You know, there's like the bank is composed of like four or five different groups. And there's some of them are just a few floors and a few buildings. And in 1990s, something major happens. And that is private capital begins to seek ways to invest in developing countries. Up until that point, it had been primarily investment going through the public sector, through governments. But this shift starts in 1990, and it goes full bore until it became major by the, by the turn of the century. In 1995, uh, Vice President Lindbach, uh, who was a president of this small section called the International Finance Corporation, uh, was, uh, was boasting at the 1995 spring meeting that IFC had increased its investments four times since, since 1900, uh, excuse me, since uh, in the past four years, and that he now had 213 projects operating around the world in a portfolio of 2.6 billion. His most successful project in that group was a project taking place in Chile called Pange. And we're going to hear a lot about Pange tonight and what happened. Now, the institutional capacity of the IFC was pretty weak. It was first, it was marginal within the global financial system. Basically, and I, I'm going to just account a quick story that uh, a very wealthy billionaire private investor met with IFC. And I was told by one of the IFC people at that time where I was operating as a, beginning as a consultant, that the wealthy person turned to the IFC and they were making some suggestions. And the wealthy person stopped him at that point. This billionaire said, I'm sorry. He said, do you listen to your banker about advice? Take advice from your banker which essentially was a put down telling them that the IFC was not a major player and certainly financially not a player in the world. They had very small environmental department. It was about, I think, three or four people. Uh, one person I remember had a portfolio himself of 208 projects around the world. For those of you that have your, your task list in Washington, you'll know that it's impossible to do that. He had little pens stuck all over the wall. There was no accountability mechanism comparable to something called the inspection panel. And the inspection panel had developed within the World Bank. It was a, it's like in, internal affairs in police departments. If there was a non-compliance of the staff with one of the guidelines the World Bank had, they could go to the inspection panel and someone on the outside could go and make a complaint. But at this time, the IFC had no, no such thing. Uh, there was uncertainty, including whether or not 
World Bank policies, those in the public sector actually applied to the private sector. Disagreements going on. Those anthropologists and people within the social sector of the public side of the International Bank of Reconstruction Development, that's a big word, but that's the more the public face group of the, of the World Bank. They felt it should be, but nobody had decided it yet. And there certainly were no standards. And it had, there, there had the, the, the IFC itself from the private sector's point of view had limited value to private investments, including other investment banks. There was a rapid change of this and a repositioning from 1990 to try this. 1990, the first private sector power project was funded there by the IFC. In 1992, they now had $1 billion capital increase at capacity. Somebody helped them with a little bit. But in 1994, the first, they initiated the first public information disclosure policy, uh, trying to set something like the public sector side of the bank, trying to set some kind of a standard. So they began with public information. In 1998, things had really changed. By then, they had developed their own standards comparable to those that were in the public sector. In 2001, they had established environmental and social sustainability as an objective of the institution. And by 2003, an amazing thing happened. In 2003, the IFC had got to the point that it had combined, it held a meeting in London with I think 10 or 12 other very large banks, international banks, and they had worked on something called the equator principle. Now, let's go back just a second to what these standards are so you understand. When we say standards, what these are, these are, are guidelines for investment. And well, I'll back up and explain what the problem is. When you do international financing, it's very important that no one covers all the risk of any particular project or investment. So it's common within the investment sector to do syndication of loans. What that means is you have multiple lenders all going together at the same time, each one carrying a a small risk in terms of their whole portfolio on that particular project or endeavor or industry. Uh, the, uh, uh, so that they, and the, one of the questions that arises when you do that is whose standards apply? For example, if there's protests going on from NGOs about environmental and social work, do the standards apply from Germany to the, to the do you take them from, from Belgium? Do you take them to the United States? Who do you listen to as you put together the syndicate? The IFC saw this as an opportunity to facilitate syndication and model something and basically build some kind of risk identification and defining what the risks are. Now, those are in the following areas on the screen was risk management. This is the areas ultimately they came to be involved in. Risk management, labor standards, resource efficiency, community, land resettlement, which was a key one coming in from the World Bank public sector, especially uh, Bill Partridge, uh, Dan Aronson, Scott Guggenheim, people, uh, Michael Chernia, and some of, and I had participated in that. Some of those were trying to define standards for people whose lands were being taken by these projects. Biodiversity, indigenous people, this was a big issue. Many of these projects took place on land that supposedly belonged to no one, but actually belonged to indigenous groups within country, within developing countries. So there needed to be some kind of standard in that area. And finally, cultural heritage, which initially was defined very narrowly, almost archeologically. Uh, the equator principles, as I said, let's go to the end of the story from we started in, in, in the 1900s. At the end, this is what we end up with. Adopted in 2003, these adhere, these equator principles adhere to what had been formalized a few years earlier by the IFC. And they included now those things as, as up to today include a new change, which is human rights itself. At first, the bank had great resistance to including human rights in it. Uh, the uh, uh, Some of you know that I, uh, thanks to Michael, I presented uh, uh, the first book on human rights and anthropology inside the bank, which drew quite a crowd, uh, mainly because uh, Shihada was going to allow people to talk about human rights in the bank. This is one of the most sensitive areas of the bank. 
the the uh, the, the idea was to provide an underlying kind of common base for risk management. And uh, now, at, at now this this equators principles, which are a set of principles that may or may not involve the IFC. Uh, they involve over 160 major financial institutions, all the major banks of the world that you can name, Morgan Stanley, go down the whole list, are there. It accounts for 70% of all international financing de developed. This is where we get somehow within less than 10 years from that initial point with that little one project starting off with a, with a dam. Uh, so they represent 70% of the national market and over 160 financial institutions. And I missed some of them on the screen, Barclays, Citibank, Credit Suisse, if what's left of it, uh, HVB and others. Uh, and you can look at those equator principles. Now within that, if you notice the timeline, 1990s when we first start off with the power project, 2003 is when we end up with the equator principles. Somewhere in between something happened. And the happened I put on the screen is 1995 to 97 was what I prefer to call tonight the Pange saga. Pange was a project in central Chile. This is not now this is not my opinion, but now the IFC in 2004 looked back, they were surprised things moved so fast too. And they said, and this is a quote from a Dustin's Learn study they did, quote, it was the project, Pange project that catalyzed the strengthening of the IFC's institutional capacity to address environmental and social issues. Most noticeably, no other project in the history of IFC has led to such ongoing controversy and far-reaching institutional change. So there's something happens between those two dates. They continue. This is the emergence of the IFC's environmental and social departments, the adoption of safeguard policies, the formation of a robust social environmental project review procedures and the establishment of their compliance officer, which is called the CA, CAL. All these aspects became the mainstay of IFC business. In effect, the Pange project defined what was the IFC's approach and gave it value. And this is a strange situation. It gave it value in the international financial markets to actually take a leadership role, beginning with something that this, whatever this saga is that we're going to talk about. And my question tonight is of the IFC's 213 projects. Remember, I told you about the guy with the little pegs on his board. Why? Why did the Pange project have such a huge impact? And what role did the social scientists and applied people and also the NGOs play in this transformation. Pangi was the straw that strengthened the camel's back. Isn't it a beautiful camel? I worked in the Middle East. <laughs> okay, so let's go to Pangi itself and tell me what this project was all about. Located in the highlands of, of, uh, of Chile, on the it's located on the uh, Argentine a border, the, the Alto Bio Bio River is a very fast moving river, you saw it at the beginning, and it comes out of the Argentine border, crashes down through Concepcion, probably 50 or 60 miles, masses of water, and it, from a power point of view, it's a beautiful resource. It also happened to be the area where the, where the Pehuenches lived. The, now, I can give you, there's a timeline, we'll go back over this in a minute, where things happen within that project, and it, if you tried you could almost turn this into a telenovela in Spanish, or you could turn it into a, a, a Netflix series of all the things that happened. And uh, from the 1992 initial investment up through the establishment of the equator principles, we'll go through some of these uh, in detail. Uh, now, let me see if this thing is working. Is it? Yes. Uh, there's some video in here that, uh, okay, so let's, let's talk about Indesa. The Pange project was an investment of private power sector uh, company. At that time, it was only located in Chile, if I remember right. It may have had something in Argentina, but it was a, a relatively, uh, you know, another one. It was a major South American power company, but certainly not of international standing. And ultimately, at the end of the story, it disappears. So don't remember it too long because it vanishes. 
However, it decided to build this dam, which you can see below. It's a it's a run of the river dam, 450 megawatts on that very fast moving river. And I'll show you as this film goes on, you'll we'll turn and look at the river. It's been diverted to build this dam. And it was one of one of five sites that were identified as being having potential for hydropower development. The IFC, as I said, was a small order operation at this time. It held a 2.5% equity in this particular project, and it loaned $170 million, which is only part of the project. At that time, but we thought it was going to cost $465 million, ended up being coming in under budget. What was important, yeah, here you go, that peligro watch out death. If you look right over the corner of the dam here, uh, right past Carmen, that was Carmen standing there. We look down and you'll see way over, if we can do that, uh, a little bit below, we're not gonna get too close so we don't fall over. And you see that, that is the Alto Bio Bio River and it is roaring class five, beautiful rapids. Okay, been diverted at this point. And, uh, and Indesa, uh, Indesa was an interesting company. Uh, Pablo, well, Pablo is here and he can help explain it maybe later on. But at that point, it was a, had the legacy of being formed, if I remember right, by some of Pinochet's generals. Pinochet had dropped out of power by that. And at this point, Chile had, get ready for this, Chile had privatized the rivers. They were uh, privately owned. And they had also privatized the communal land of the Indians that are in this area. And Indesa had another characteristic, part of the story that has never been written, that maybe should be, is Indesa was also deeply involved in religious issues. Uh, some of the people that were involved with it were members of Opus Dei. And, uh, and they were involved with the Indians not solely from the interest of development, but they had interest in develop in protecting their souls from the Protestants. That part of the story is almost never told. Now we go to Argentina itself. This is the, uh, that's that blue line is the Alto Bio Bio River, uh, Concepcion at the uh, upper left, going down. The Pehuenches were scattered in this whole area along the Argentine. They, they actually have Pehuenches over in the Argentine side. And the plan was to build one, two, three, four, five beds, but the only one the IFC got wrapped up in, uh, only dam was the, the Central Pange. Uh, the, uh, let me go, uh, yeah, let's say something about the Pehuenches. There's four or 5,000 Pehuenches at this time, nobody really knew, uh, clearly, and they are, unlike a lot of Native Americans in Latin America, they're, they're a band level group that's extremely dispersed. Uh, there's no central place. There's no village. When we went in there in 1995, there wasn't even a little tendita, not a store. Uh, I had difficulty, except for the schools, I had difficulty finding any place to meet in order to carry out uh, an evaluation I was supposed to do. But the other thing is the Pehuenches have dispersed settlements. They're indigent, super indigent, some of the poorest people in Chile. And they had a... Uh, uh, let me go down here and put some disparate. And they only won, in 1995, we had only one person with a secondary education degree uh, in the group. He was hired by me. They're politically marginal and a little bit difficult for the more conservative part of the Chilean uh, people uh, to, uh, to tolerate. Uh, Claudio, maybe if he's here, he can go later as to say partially why that's true. Uh, they were not really conquered uh, by the Spanish. In fact, they did a good number on the, on the Spanish because they were horsemen, had skills, and using a lance, they could crack open Spanish armor like a lobster, just pew, pop it open. Uh, and those are uh, that's some of the other early Pehuenches. Uh, this is a typical area near one of the meeting places uh, in the area. They're mostly on horseback at that time. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll explain why that picture, uh, the woman you expecting some of them to dress like Indians. Well, I'm sorry, many of, the, many of their clothings were coming from donations from California. And this lady asked me, are all the, are all the women in California is thin? Uh, because if you notice the, uh, the blouse that she pulled out of the donation bag 
was a little tight. Uh, but they, uh, but they don't have. Now let's go back to the beginning. In the beginning, it's like I guess it's like in the Bible. In the beginning, in many projects around the World Bank, there was Scott Guggenheim. Scott, Scott is a, and there he's horsing around. Scott is one of these geniuses when it comes to developing new ideas for developing people. It's absolutely, I could go through, we could have, we should have him on WAPA to go through his, his, uh, his, his resume, what he did. But in, in Scott was brought, he was in the World Bank. He was brought over to IFC as they planned this particular Panga investment. And he dreamed up an idea. He said, you know what? There's going to be, uh, there's going to be profits flowing from this dam. Why don't we dedicate a very small percentage of those profits to something, to a foundation, and a foundation that can help the Indians develop? And that was his plan. Uh, another, just to leap ahead, I'll go into that in detail in a minute. But in 1995, uh, I'm wrapped up with an initial desire to do an evaluation of that foundation. Uh, it was part of the original plan. And at that, in Albuquerque meeting, Cherney is receiving the Malinowski Award at the Society for Applied Anthropology meeting. And at that, there's a protest. Uh, the, uh, a group called the Grupo de Alto Bio Bio, it's a GAB, an opposition group, had gathered at the meeting to oppose Cherney's, uh, they were using him as a target for opposing what was happening in Alto Bio Bio. And in the middle of that, uh, Cherney, Bill Partridge and I sat down in a very visible place in the middle of the hotel, and we discussed, negotiated, not having a protest in exchange for an in-depth evaluation of other things happening on this project. So that's how I became initially involved. I had no previous attention, never been to Chile in my life. Okay, let's go back. This is the design. I'll just quickly go over it. Uh, Scott Guggenheim's design was, it was, the, uh, I think, one of the first benefit sharing operations. Uh, the idea was poverty alleviation. It was supposed to, this was all put into the investment agreement with Endesa, preserve and reinforce Pewinchi cultural identity, the long same development, make a best effort to arrange for electrification. For those of you that are in development, that word best effort should have been sent to hell. Uh, best effort means they asked questions, can we do it? And the answer was no. So you never want that expression, never want to see it again. And finally, they were supposed to mitigate post uh, boom impacts. Uh, let me, the, the, the initial foundation, it was unclear who the target was. And so they, they defined it into three communities, Kayaki, which is the light brown, the, and, and uh, Petril, which is up here on the northern, uh, nearby it, and Capuco Rarco. Now, these two towns have names that sound alike, but they're not towns. They're just areas with scattered people living. It's kind of like throwing raisins up in the air and having them come down. Those were the three initial areas to deal with the foundation. The rest of the Pewinchi area was not. That's important because this darker green area above was the location of what was going to be the next dam which was RALCO, not financed by the IFC and highly controversial because it would involve the relocation of almost a large number of Pewinches from that area up into this way, way up onto the highest, highest mountains in the area called El Barco. Uh, that was, now Carmen and I had a great time doing the evaluation. We ran into trouble immediately because the project was so controversial. How am I doing? Yeah, it was so controversial that the initial team we hired in, in Santiago, which I thought was going to be working with us, turned out it sound, signed two contracts, one with us and the other with another group to spy on us uh, that was related, we think, to the power company. When I found that out, we dismissed them, told them never to show up. They didn't, and we were caught with essentially no one to work with us. So what we did was we trained a local team of Pewinches. All the people in this group that you're seeing had third grade education. One of them was illiterate. That's the one in the background with the camera. And you're gonna see some of his camera work in a minute. Uh, we brought him in as a videographer for the entire project. We didn't have a place to meet either. And if you see the, 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 the tent, we created a central place. I essentially put up a tent in the middle of the forest 
and people would it was so curious Carmen and I in a group with the people would show up to to look at what in the world is this we tent doing here meetings. yeah we'd schedule a meeting they come down on horses or walk down and we'd have a meeting uh, I used a, this is critical to the story. We used a whole variety of techniques, everything from participatory work, conventional ethnographic work that all of you know, and some advanced ethnographic techniques that Carmen and I designed, including giving photo, uh, cameras to the to the Pewinches, having them photograph what they thought was important, and then interpreting it. Uh, a whole bunch of issues, and let me just show some of them right here. Carmen ran women's focus groups. Since we have no place, you meet in the forest on the floor. And there she is. And uh, I, oh yeah, here's a little bit of a piece of that run. Uh, that's uh, it's Carmen carrying out some of our techniques. And uh, and you'll see, I think this one is, oh, it's interesting. There should be somewhere in the background, the horses were tied up while we were meeting. I thought it'd show up in this video, but I'll move forward. Uh, let's do the next one. Uh, we also introduced, I had a problem. There was so much controversy as to what the Pewinches believed or didn't believe. It was critical to me that I had quantitative information. So to get that, Carmen and I introduced voting. And you see on the left-hand side, uh, uh, one of our assistants, that's Luis, right? Yeah, Luis. Yeah, uh, the, the Luis is, uh, Luis has made uh, little diagrams of different ways of communication between the foundation and the Pewinji people. He laid them out on the ground. People then vote by dropping sticks on the ones that they thought represented the type of interaction. This was even more interesting. Carmen made this apron, which had pockets on it. And we had long discussions and we tie pieces of paper on the mark, on the, the uh, on the pockets, and they represented to make it to summarize it: short-term, long-term, and medium-term investments. Then we handed out five mar marbles to everybody who was participating, and we gave them the chance to come over. And I'll jump it ahead; they could come over. There's Carmen back in those days, and they could come and vote with their marbles as to which of the particular plans or which of the particular investments they'd like to see. This was to destroy a myth that people had about the Pewinches essentially would drink any windfall profits. And, and, it, and the perception was, where would they, if they had a choice, and we gave them choices with five marbles they couldn't decide equally. And they would see, as you watch them voting here on the, pro, the project, uh, I'll leap it ahead a little bit. Uh, quite an, it was quite enthusiastic. There she is. The lady's voting with her marbles, making her decisions and quite excited. Uh, and then after we did this, after we do the voting, we would turn around and open the pockets. And unlike the United States, we actually had transparency in how we counted votes. <laughs> That's tongue in cheek. And so we, we, did the, we, did, we did the counting in front uh, and we didn't have uh, Giuliani or anybody else behind us complaining about our, our voting system. Oh, there we are, we're pulling out we're pulling out the pieces of the, pulling out the marbles from the different bags. You could see the guy with the little plastic bag showing them. And then we counted them in public so the Pewinches could see. To everyone's surprise, especially the Pewinches, their voting was primarily, you could see, for the long-term, long-term investments. And there was quite a bit of surprise and amazement as they watched the results of their consensus. And you could see the satisfaction as they realized that they were showing people, including themselves, how they, they preferred investments. Okay, now the findings, to go quickly into that, I think the findings of what we found in the foundation are probably not that important right now. For one thing, this was a first time effort. Uh, Scott did a wonderful job trying. Uh, there was a lot of confusion. The Endesa, the company was running the foundation primarily, and they developed something called, when I got there, they told me, oh, we've done 5,000 projects. Well, I'm sorry. When I heard that, I couldn't believe it. A project was where they made a purchase. Yeah. Basically what they developed was a discount purchase scheme so that people could buy a mattress and get a percentage off. The other thing that I had to check was, this was a, did the foundation have an impact on poverty? And what fortunately, because there were areas that were in the foundation and outside the foundation, and I had good census data, good economic census data from the Chilean government, I was able to compare the inside to the outside and discovered there was almost no impact at all on poverty alleviation. We used uh, 
those of you who did cognitive anthropology, we developed a, a system, a triad test to see whether those purchases or projectos as they called them, uh, what they really were like mentally with the Fewinches and we compared it to many different kinds of, of uh, things like loans and gifts and exchanges and purchases and, and gave that. This is the result of those votings that came in with the little sticks. And we were able to show the communications between the Pewinches and the foundation and the quality of that. Basically, uh, that was a, the, but that's, let's go to the most important thing. In the process, we made three unanticipated discoveries, ones that would cause a real problem. And in fact, one of them, well, I'll tell you which one in a second. One is, well, all of them. The, the, uh, one, of the, the, my, one of the people inside the IFC said, uh, Ted, why did you send a rocket up their ass? End quote. That's what, <laughs> and this is the unexpected discoveries. Uh, first, there was extensive deforestation. There was no disclosure of what the agreements, they had no idea that this foundation was here because of decisions made in Washington, DC. And finally, and the most amazing of all, is the foundation had been diverted and was being used for planning a resettlement in that area that was outside the foundation. How did we find the visualization experiment? An absolute piece of luck. There's only one road going in and out of this place. There's a, there's a little, what do you call those things? A little cabin, a little caseta, what's a caseta? Uh, a, a, a little place that when they bring forest out, they have to say, where did it come from? Where, you know, where was it cut? And they have a little slip of paper. Like that they, yeah, like a checkpoint, as Carmen said. At the checkpoint, they had been throwing all these pieces of paper in the back room, nobody reads all this bureaucratic stuff. We found it and we took it all and we analyzed it to see where had the forest come down, how much had been left. What we discovered in time series was that the, the penetration road for the dam had resulted in a huge deforestation. The losses, when we calculated on, on several models, ranged from, depending on the low to the high cost model, 3.5 to $18.4 million in forestry forest material had been in timber had been removed from the Pewenchi area. The foundation had received by this IFC agreement only slightly over a half a million dollars. Basically, my conclusion was the Pewenchi were subsidizing the Pangi Dam project from their point of view. This is the video that caught that shook the world. Uh, in the process of being there, uh, Carmen and I followed the foundation director who's in white pants in blue right here. We followed him into a meeting outside the area where the foundation was supposed to be operating and he was only supposed to be working on the IFC project. What we discovered in this, and you watch it for a minute, is this, he was in the process of planning the forced relocation of, somebody just came in, I'll let it, somebody, okay. This is, let me see if I can turn the sound. Oh, yeah. Listen. Everyone in the community is not going to be affected, he's telling the Pewenches. The water's not going to cover everybody. The guy that's living up the hill is not going to be underwater. Other people, the water is going to only come to their ankles. There's some that are actually going to get hit. If you watch, if you watch the video, sí. there's objections going on to the Pewenches, to the resettlement, and he's screaming at them uh, as the video goes on. Uh, shortly after this video, uh, I'll just uh, say this in a second. Shortly after this, uh, uh, the that video was evidence that I had that there was a resettlement with bank involvement being prepared for the Pewinches in the mountains. At the end of that video, the director or the man who's screaming 
notices that I had the camera. Oh, that was a, uh, if you look, that's me right here in the corner. You see that? And I had put the camera up on a, on a, on a, uh, on a, on a filing cabinet. When he notices it, uh, Carmen and I hightailed it down the mountain, 60 miles, fast as we could go, sent a, a, a fax to the, the World Bank and said, look out, this is something's gone wrong down here. Well, the first next question I got from them was, do you have any copies of the video? I said, not that you're going to see. And that was the beginning of the chilling effect that I had with the bank itself. Other people, I think some people knew this was happening. So afterwards, let's just go what happened. Afterwards, there was a whole string of events happened. First is my report, which I wrote in 1996. Barbara Johnson wrote a nice paper on this with Carmen. My report was finished and embargoed could not be shown. My terms of reference with the IFC said I was to share it and return, share it with the Pewinches. They were in the process of being prepared for resettlement. The bank did not, the IFC did not want them to see this. Uh, and that little video you saw uh, was never shown. Uh, afterwards, uh, in a controversy developed, uh, a man called Jay Hare, who was the uh, former chair of the international, no, for the president, the International Wildlife, Wildlife Federation, Federation uh, International Union for Conservation Nature, excuse me, uh, <coughs> chair and had a team and they were to come in. Wolfenson asked them to compare what was happening in this project with the World Bank standards. His project, his report was redacted, heavily redacted such that most people never saw it. Uh, there was a whole thing. There was a lot of controversy went on. Uh, the American Anthropological Association, thanks to Barbara Johnston and with Turner, held a, uh, a, a, a hearing in Washington at the Washington AAA meeting. Uh, I had claimed there was a human rights violation. Claudio Gonzalez uh, and uh, Jeannie backed me up from Chile and came up. Uh, we had a hearing. Uh, the American Anthropological Association ruled in our favor. Uh, I ended up getting blackballed for 10 years. That was my end of my involvement with the World Bank for that time. I came back later, uh, like the resurrection. Somehow they let me come back and I worked with the inspection panel. There were lots and lots of things happening. But what the main thing that you saw was the effects in the IFC, which I went and I'll stay near the end here, which were those changes that were happening inside the IFC thanks to people pushing them hard from the inside and the outside to develop their own standards. And with quite honesty, from their point of view, the, uh, the IFC saw the advantages of adopting the very thing they were opposing, which was those social and environmental policies. Okay, last thing, postscripts. And DESA paid off its loan after my report was shown to them in English afterwards. Hare's report was never released. The, the compliance officer of IFC was a wonderful person who felt guilty with what was happening with the Pewinchi. And here's just a small story. There was, there was a Pewinchi resettled on that first dam and the family called Soto Mayor. To show you how you do a resettlement without these standards, they handed him cash. He went to a motel in a nearby little village with his animals. He was the richest Pewinchi in that area. He fed his animals until he ran out of food. He ended up having only a dog and it left over. At that point, he couldn't stay in the motel. He moved into a manger at the, that a friend of his owned. And in that manger, he had a baby born. But no, but no, in that baby, excuse me, in the manger, he didn't have a baby. His wife got pregnant. Uh, this, this is the card sent by... Wolfenson out for his Christmas, for his card to, it was kind of an advertising card, sent out to people around the bank. I took that card, and Jerry Moles remembers this, and I turned it into a Christmas card. I sent it back to Wolfenson, and I said, put the baby back in the manger. Yeah, the, the, the problem was the state took the baby away. Yeah, yeah. Carmen's saying what happened is his mother was pregnant, in the hospital, since she was living, the family was living in a manger, they wouldn't allow the, the baby, the state kept the baby, they wouldn't allow it to go back. I sent Wolfenson this card asking him to put the baby back in the manger by Christmas. On Christmas Eve, where I'm sitting right here in Tucson, 
we were called by the secretaries of the World Bank saying, they, one of them was almost crying. She said, Ted, she said, the baby's back in the manger. Anyway, so that's just the end of the story. There's much, much more to go, the, the, the standards themselves, but I'll stop at this point, take questions or comments, and thank you very much. Everybody's asleep. Yeah, thank you so much, Ted. That was fascinating. So a um, few things. Um, I'll take a look at the chat, but don't be shy. You know, ask your question on your own behalf. The best way to do it is, since I can see everybody on one screen, is to use the raise hand function where it says reactions. Um, if you want to, like, uh, when, when you do ask your question, if it's possible to see your wonderful face, that we'd appreciate that. So um, maybe maybe people need a chance to just kind of absorb. But we have we have plenty of time. Yes, one. Or Ted, you want to call on people, and I'll look at the chat. Oh no! Okay, wait. Never mind. I will. Sorry, we're usually more together than this. I'll call okay. on people because this sure, way sure. I can keep everything on gallery, and okay. then Ted, you can just see everybody, you know, on speaker view. Okay. Sorry about that. Go ahead, Juan. You need to unmute. I was saying good evening to to you all. Hi, Ted. Hey. <laughs> My God, Miri, tantos años. Okay. Tantos años, see. <laughs> you can tell, we can tell. It's pretty amazing to be sitting here listening to you, Ted, seriously. Wow. Uh, you know, it makes me a bit um, emotional. And because you know the mitigations that you mentioned were a sham and a shame. You know, I've been in the upper BOB, of course, uh, recently and quite a few times. And they are just like they were when you were there and maybe worse. I mean, absolutely worse, right? Because they lost almost everything, right? The, the, the culture, the people, the, the communities were dismembered. Well, you know, it's terrible the young people are trying to somehow you know revive or revindicate whatever you know they're fighting against another dam you know another dam was built the angostura by colbun after pange and ralco in spite that the govern government had promised that no more dams were going to be built in the upper bio bio because of the disaster and now a chinese company is planning to build another one Rukalwe, you know so the disaster hasn't stopped at all, you know. I wanted to make a few precisions, Ted, if you allow me, you know. This is not a, the Pange is not a run of the river, uh, dam. it's a dam. Run of the river is a hydro plant without a dam. And you said it was a run of the river. And in fact, the, the dam is 113 meters high. So it's a very large dam, right? Running across the whole valley. And the BOBO -Bio is 380 kilometers long. And remember that they were planning to build seven dams, six on the BOBO -Bio and one on the Keuco. Remember, Ted? The plan, you know, if you look at this, it's pretty amazing what engineers can have in their heads, you know, because they wanted to transform the whole upper BOBO. -Bio. The upper BOBO -Bio is the upper section of the river. The, bio, the, the river is called the Bio Bio, right? But this is the upper Bio Bio. They want to build this hydraulical series of six dams, one after the other, you know, like a stairwell of dams, you know? But can you imagine somebody going there? It was one of the most beautiful places I have ever seen. And I, ha I have been around, you know? And these guys, these engineers go there and they plan to transform the whole upper bio, bio into a hydraulical artifact. You know, it's something that blows my mind, you know, the way these people can look at things, you know. And then you said, um, Ted, that they privatize rivers. Well, it's pretty true, but the, the, what happened is they privatized water, right? That's the thing. Water in Chile is totally privatized. And not, not only the water, the element, but also 
the management of water is in private hands. 100%, you know, is in private hands for mm -hmm. agriculture or for hydro development or for, you know, drinking water. It's all in private hands. You know, the water that feeds Santiago de Chile, the capital of Chile, is under control of a French company called GDF Suez. The water for 8 million people in Chile, the company who gets the profits from you know, providing the service is a French company. And Chile is full of this transnational you know, occupation of the country. It's pretty shocking, really. Huh? <laughs> and then another thing, a little thing, it's uh, GAB, our group, was never about recreation, uh, Ted, never. The thing is, we got our first funding from kayakers and rafters, but we were never concerned. We didn't even like, you know, because the gringos that came to do the rafting and kayaking in the Bio Bio, they didn't leave anything in the locality, you know? It, they work like in a closed system, right? So no profits, no little chains, nothing. So we didn't even like them. But the thing is, they funded our first office, you know? So, but we were all about the ecological impacts and the social impacts, you know, on the Pehuenche. That was our concern, yes. And the last thing I want to say is that, unfortunately, I have to tell you all that we had another case here in the, in the metropolitan region by a North American company called AES Corp that built a huge, this time, run of the river in the Maipo River. This is the watershed, the basin, that gives drinking water to 8 million people, as I said, and that irrigates 140,000 hectares of agriculture. And this watershed is desertifying as we speak. We are, we are under a process of desertification. And Chile, the authorities authorized this you know, run of the river very complicated system with 75 kilometers of tunnels conducting the water from the upper upper Maipo down to, to the machine houses and the whole thing. And you know, we again went to the, the COW, Compliance Advisory Ombudsman of the IOC, because sorry, they funded, they gave money, and they also, you know, how can I say this? They supported politically this project as an excellent renewable project, you know. Right now, the project is, is not working because the tunnels fell down. But, but and, just, yes. can, we, let's, uh, can I say something about yes. you for a moment? Okay. Okay. Yes. And now let's let uh, uh, Barbara's here and many others that played part of the story. Uh, I just, I forgot something very important that during the process, you and the group of Alto Bio Bio, Grupo de Acción, por el Alto Bio. Yes, you you made a complaint against you. They, you tried to go through the inspection panel. It happened yes. right after I left the field, yes. and and the bank decided that the the inspection panel in the World Bank side and the private sector decided that their policies that their no that their panel was not applicable yes. to to the private sector. Because of that, that drove the IFC into it. But I think we should take a second and listen to, uh, and uh, it's so good to see you. It's been many, many, many years and, and you played a major part in changing. In yeah, let's stay in contact, please. Uh, yes, says, oh. I, had, I, I just needed to close this, Ted, that we just went because of the good experience somehow that we had with the Bio, Bio thanks to you and Jay Hare, you know, we went again to the complaint mechanisms of both banks that lend money for this project in the Maipo River. You know, mm -hmm. it was a, again, you know, totally, absolutely useless, useless. It took them six years to produce a useless report, Ted. You know, it was very harmful because it created expectations and people thought that maybe we could do something to stop this project or even to question the fine, whatever. And the project is not operating, it's a disaster. It's the most expensive hydro project in the world, $3.5 billion for a run for a river hydro plant, you know? So the mechanisms are worse than when you were there and Jay Hare came and et cetera. Sorry to say, I wanted to close oh, with that.
But this is good news for the younger people because they have work to do. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, who else do we have? I can't see the screen. Uh, Thank you so much. This is one of the um, things that's so great about um, Zoom is that we can have people from around the world. Um, uh, except one, great, I'm glad you lowered your hand because it makes it hard for me to see who else. I think Kent, you're raising your actual hand. Yes. Welcome everybody. Um, I'm actually the, I was the team leader for Pange from 89 to 90. So I would, you know, first of all, Tad, an excellent summary. You really lay out the challenge an institution like IFC has in dealing with the private sector and the leverage it has and what it can do to be affect better change. And quite honestly, a lot of mistakes in the process, but the question, the dynamic we always had as an institution is, what happens if we don't get engaged and the project happens without us, Others, knowing that we might do a project and do things wrong, which we did with Pange in retrospect, but in the long run, it affects change. And you have to realize in IFC in 1989-90, when I was there working on this project, we, as you said, IFC was not known in global finance because global finance was not focused on the emerging markets. So we were very much just one of the, cat one of the few catalysts and primarily export development agencies and sometimes the banks we could in syndicate with would be the primary financiers of projects. So the dynamic we always had with, with uh, uh, Apange was what happens if we walk away? And quite honestly, they tried to walk away for years because once they had agreed to what we, what we did achieve, which in retrospect has lots of holes into it, totally fair, but it did achieve things that had never been done before. They put in, press, in, 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 in terms of uh, perspective, and, and I did want to greet one of Juan Pablo Orrego because we met years ago and I did respect his work, although we very often had disagreements. Um, when you look at it, why do we get attracted to the project? It was one of the best hydro dams in potential in the world. And it turned out that way. If you look 30 years later in terms of good hydro projects, Pange is probably in the top five in terms of resettlement and flooding, number one. Ironically, it was the first project we took the environmental, we just had hired an environmental specialist a few months earlier. And again, IFC should have been earlier in the game, but that's the reality. That was, Pange was his first project. Because I met my, the reason I'm on this conference call is because I was sent the link by my wife, Augusta Molnar, who's an anthropologist. I met her in grad school. Um, she was the one that, that, that suggested Scott be the anthropologist for the project because IFC had never had a, an anthropologist in the project. And I was like to think I was somewhat sensitive to the fact that I saw there were Pehuenches. Let's have a resettlement expert get involved. And we were able to uh, second Scott for that. We did have, as you point out, Ted, we created the PayOn Foundation or had the company create it out of the company profits. First time IFC had ever done that. Unfortunately, I know full well going into that, there were holes in it. For example, and that's had four seats of control versus PayOn J3. These are kind of calculated bets you often make saying, this is gonna have a reaction and hopefully the reaction will be a good reaction. And it did exactly that. Um, we, we also did something had never done before, which we actually had IFC do an environmental cost benefit assessment. And then in case of Chile, it was the best possible project available. All that being said, you know, in retrospect, a lot of things went wrong. I would say number one, the biggest problem we had was the arrogance of Indesa management. They didn't want to listen to them. I think you know that full well, as I think you know, seeing the, the uh, gentleman speak in, in, in the Peowenche meeting, that is exemplified their, their, their thinking. Um, and like I said, there were a lot of thoughts, especially on the team, well, should we continue or not? Because Andessa wanted to drop us after they'd made so many of the agreements. And then they said, well, if, we, if, you, if, if IFC walks away, then we can get the deal done the way we want. 
And we purposely, and I was actually in backdoor conversations occasionally with the government saying, you know, do you want us in there or not? And they wanted us in there. And so we stayed and we were able to, and they were able to apply a little leverage on, on Indessa because there's, again, as many mistakes as were made, the government knew they needed to prove a lot of the standards. And this was a good first step that didn't imply political leverage on them, but on the private sector. Um, I guess the question, as I always say, is how does an organization like IFC apply leverage on the private sector? When I first got engaged, there were a few players. Now there are a lot of players. So the leverage of the IFC is much, much, much less. But like I say, I think in retrospect, totally concur with you. One of the greatest things IFC did was get the equator principles uh, adopted by banks. Because once you have a level playing field, IFC could push forward because then they don't have lower class alternatives. So it, it, it's, it's ironic that I guess in many respects, it's probably the hardest project I ever worked on in IFC. And I, again, I left in 1990 on the project after the deal was due diligence and structured, but I didn't carry it on from there. Or maybe it was 92. Uh, and then it was subsequently taken to the board. It was a, delayed a few years because of the delay in demand of, of, of electricity in Chile. So the project probably held off. But like I said, I, it's, it's ironic because I think as, as bad as it was, it achieved at least my personal objective in IFC was to push the envelope and things might have been wrong. And then you try to make them go better. And again, it's unfortunate. And the fact that, like you said, Juan Pablo talks about the government and how badly they, they behave. I can't say anything about IFC's involvement or with other projects. I wasn't. But if that's the case, I, too, am disappointed. But all in all, this was exactly in my mind what IFC wanted to do, would do a project like this push the limits, make mistakes, and have you guys come in and say, here's what you got to do to make it better. And hopefully in the long term, benefits are positive. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Good seeing you in San Augusta. I haven't seen her in years, but thank you. <laughs> she wanted to emphasize my remarks are my remarks and not her remarks. Okay, you know, I actually worked for her on one project. Okay, who, any, anybody else? I can't see the hands up. Yeah, Mary Clark. Mary Qualic. Mary. Uh, uh, then I'm unmuted. Oh, thank you very much for your presentations. And Juan, thank you very much for adding that, the rich additions that you added. My question may also apply to Kent. I'm interested in how the profits from the electricity and the actual electricity generated by the dam were, gener were distributed. Maybe Juan Pablo can say so, but I know at the time uh, the Pewinches were using uh, King K's, those little, uh, what do you call those things? Uh, uh, you know, the, the oil burning lamps. Yeah. That's all they had when I was there. But they, have things improved, Juan Pablo? Yes, a little bit. But uh, the person who asked, you know, the, the, the answer is, as I was saying, in Chile, Generation, transmission, and distribution were 100% privatized. Mm -hmm. So the profits go to these private companies. Now it's Enel, it's an Italian company that controls like 80% of the electricity Chilean market, you know, 80%. It's an Italian company. I'm not exaggerating with this, you know, it's this is totally neo-colonial. So the profits go to the hands of the transnationals, you see directly. And the Pehuenche now have, for sure, more access to electricity. Not all, all of them, because they live, you know, as in, in El Barco, Ted, you know, very high up in the in the mountains, you know. Mary Clark, did that answer your questions? Well, did the, what? If I could jump in, I would help. Yep. Go ahead. No, just to add from, from, from the initial point of view, what the company would, what the Payowen Foundation was receiving, and I hope and assume it's the same today, is 0.25% of the profits. Yeah. So that's not a major amount, but it's, it's still significant. 
And the intention was that the, the foundation would decide how to use that money. And what happened in the Pale Wind Foundation is imitated almost everywhere where you have community foundations and you have uh, natural resource funding shared with the community as initially it's very, very short term focused on immediate needs where the, 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 the strategy has to be longer term is to lay a groundwork for long term benefits. I was surprised to hear that Pale Wind is we're actually more citrus in the long-term benefits because I hadn't heard that before. Oh, can I can I elaborate on further? Uh, did did the government did the government? How did the government benefit from this? From the the privatization? What was the interest of the government in terms of the energy? Usually, energy is a big power issue, and I don't just mean generating lights. So how how did the government use this privatization to their interests? I mean, was that part of the picture here? No, the thing is, uh, Mary, that this this happened during the dictatorship, during Pinochet. Actually, this happened exactly in 1989, the year before we came back to our captive democracy, you see? This was a process that was totally undemocratic. You know, it was like with no questions. They took over the whole, you know, electricity sector. You know, they privatized, they created during the dictatorship a consortium called Enersis that agglomerated, as I said, generation, transmission, and distribution. This has changed a little bit since, but at that point it was that way. And then in 1989, they privatized the whole consortium. So with one stroke, they privatized generation, transmission, and distribution of electricity. So the country, how does the government or whatever the country benefit from, from this is that, in fact, we have a good supply of electricity in Chile. I have to say that the system is quite solid. You know, we don't have blackouts generally. You know, the system works well. Another thing is the tariffs. You know what we are being charged that's another story and that we lost control as a country of water and electricity that's pretty amazing it's like science fiction you see and that's the way we are right now the way we can chile is right now very good who else do we have with uh questions i can't see the the hands up but that uh, i'll I think I can wrap this up by going back to something that I wanted to say at the end that I forgot. Um, the question is, did the Pewinchis reorder the cosmos? And I think the answer is clear. They did. Not their own as much as we hoped, but they certainly reordered the IFC. And uh, and, and set up, now we've got equator stairs over there. So yeah, the Pewinchis were right. Uh, do you agree one, Pablo? Yeah. Ted, the thing is, it's fair to say, uh, Ted, who started, and this is not an ego thing, because we work in a collective, who started the BOBO -BO defense campaign? It was us from Santiago. You know, there was even a North American lady there involved, Catherine Bragg. She's an ethnobotanist who was the first person to hear about the dam, you know, project and warn the Chilean people about it, you know. So we went up to the upper Bio, Bio to raise, you know, the Pehuenche long cost. You know, that that is the way it, it is, you see. So we were right. Well, I don't, I, you know, for me, uh, the Bio, Bio case is a, how can I say, a disaster and a loss. And we were defeated, Ted, because we were right that this place was marvelous and unique and amazing. And it, it, it received a death blow, seriously. You should go, all of you, you should go to the Apple Bio, Bio and see what I mean, you know, with your own eyes, you know, check out the situation of the Pehuenche. They are, Ted, as poor as before. Mm -hmm. And now even worse because the communities have been fragmented, you know, and precarized, you know. It's terrible to go up to the Bio, Bio. The young people, are doing an effort to bring back, you know, the culture, to revive some, somehow many things, you know. For me, this is a drama, 
seriously. Right? You know, Ted, that one of the ladies that resisted and, until the end, Nicolasa Gintreman, the Ralco Dam, she was mm -hmm. drowned in the dam. Do you know that? Did you know that? She no. drowned in the Ralco Dam. One of the last defenders fighting against the second dam drowned in the dam. Well, this is mythological, seriously, I mean, but in a bad way, you know. Yeah, she appears in some of the videos. And by the way, those videos, uh, it's interesting. Uh, one of the, which, who was it? That was uh, Segundo, right? The videographer, Segundo. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, his work, uh, we've got quotes of it now. His work is absolutely amazing. Uh, as he did the videography, uh, he'd never used a camera. He had never learned to read and write. And when he got the camera, if you look at the actual videos that we have, he's focusing on not only on who's speaking, he's speaking, he's focusing on what the people are doing. Uh, he and she's in the in the video. Everybody's there as you watch them. So uh, we have a, a beautiful record, which we have to get out uh, so everybody can see it. But thank you. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight and, and, uh, and Shirley and I know that uh, Willie and a lot of people are here. Go ahead, Mon. I just want, yes, I want to tell you all something pretty amazing. Ted, we have 95 hours of recordings of the BOBO Bio defense campaign. 95 hours. And we are not now trying to raise funds to edit like a docu-series, you are there. We have the meeting with the world. No, we have you all there. We have fil we filmed the meetings with Jay here, the meetings with you, you know, 95 hours since the beginning until from 19, let's say 90 until 2001, 94, 95 hours. So that is going to tell the real story of the of what happened in the upper BOBO, you know? Well, to me, the story is watching the people vote and express their opinion, yes. uh, not necessarily the fact that Carmen and I were there doing the work. Uh, that's the critical thing that those people are, many of them have passed away by this point. So thank you. Thank you, that was fantastic. It's um, It's so great to, hear the long view and um, I hope that inspires people to to keep on keeping on. Um, we are going to be meeting quite soon for our May meeting, um, May 2nd, and Robert Winthrop is going to um, continue with an ecological theme focusing on the U.S. Um, so we're kind of sandwiching Earth Day. Uh, that will be our last formal program of the of the program year, but please keep um, you know keep a keep tuned because there will be some in person opportunities coming up of a more social nature. Uh, we are always looking for speakers. We our recommendation to the board is to continue having the majority of our programs on Zoom because it's I mean look what happens we can bring people from all over the world. But we are also looking for people who can uh, perhaps do salons, um, perhaps uh, focusing on work that is a little less developed in a smaller setting. So I want to thank you again. And you should get something in your inbox very soon about the May 2nd meeting. OK, take care, everyone. Happy Earth Day. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you again. <laughs>